In 2006, the British Army had a problem. The Land Rover. It had been in service with the military since the Second World War. A green Land Rover was, maybe still is, almost a symbol of the British Army. But it was turning into a death trap. And the solution would come in part from the unlikely world of motorsport. The Snatch was the latest Land Rover designed to withstand attacks by IRA insurgents. It was a £50,000 Land Rover fitted out with armour panels and bulletproof glass, designed to defeat small arms fire and petrol bombs. Fast forward 10 years and as the British Army entered Basra in Iraq, it was confident of success, pointing to its experience in Northern Ireland. Iraq, though, was a different sort of insurgency. I think there was a, a high level of confidence in that, in that, you know, people were going to do a job that they were already very good at doing. And there was a very, you know, it was a very benign feeling. We, we knew that the insurgency was starting to, um, to gather pace. So the, the formed troops of the, the Iraqi army had been effectively defeated and dispersed. Um, and now we were starting to see the infighting about who was going to, to take power. They were starting to get together. They were starting to get organised and they were starting to equip and they were starting to get purpose. Soon, mines and improvised explosive devices were being used against the lightly armoured vehicles. The Land Rovers were fatally unprotected. British soldiers began to die in the vehicles, and as the success of the devices rose, so too did their use, both in Iraq and Afghanistan, where there were more than 10 million legacy anti-tank mines, remnants from the Soviet invasion. But the Ministry of Defence insisted that the Land Rover's speed and size made them the most suitable vehicles, despite their fatal flaw. They could patrol down narrow streets and were less intimidating to the local populations. As the death toll in the vehicles began to rise, they became infamous and they gained a nickname, Mobile Coffins. One of the soldiers killed in a Land Rover was Jack Sadler. Jack, a uh, very conscientious lad, um, always wanted to be at the front, at the front of everything, you know. And uh, I think people trusted him, you know, he was that sort of bloke, you know. Uh, Jack was in a convoy. They came up to a wadi, a uh, dried up riverbed, and uh, Jack's Land Rover was sent ahead to do a recce and find a good place to go in and out of the wadi. They went into the wadi, they found a route out, it was perfectly all right. They came back a different way to take a shortcut up this steep bit and that's where Jack got blown up. It's a very strange place to be. I mean, Jack and I were really close. We were, we were very close. So it's, it's actually, it's like a big hole opening up, a big dark hole, and you're afraid to go too close to it in case you fall in it. And I don't know what will happen if you fell into the hole. It's like, an, if you can imagine in your brain, it's like a big imaginary black hole there in front of you. And you get this, tight tightness around your chest that makes you feel that you can't breathe properly. It's this bearing down on your chest. The vicar told me that that's grief. A year before Jack was killed in 2006, then Defence Secretary Des Brown ordered a review into the vehicles. After the month long review, the MOD concluded that the Land Rovers provide the best mobility for the difficult terrain of Iraq and Afghanistan. The Army also advised Defence Ministers that the larger mine-protected patrol vehicles, such as the RG31, were regarded as unsuitable replacements. So the Land Rover stayed in use, 
and the British Army still had no mine protected vehicles. Long term procurement programmes which had been established was, it, were not flexible enough in being able to be changed fast enough to take into account what was being learnt on operations. There was no procurement policy to source an alternative to the Slatch Land Rover. Um, and that continued up until the point that I, as, as, a, as a minister, asked Des Brown to give me a tasking to create a procurement for a new replacement type vehicle for the Snatch Land Rover under an, un, under an urgent operational requirement. And as a result of that, Mastiff got procured and delivered to, to theatre in 23 weeks, which was, you know, like years faster than any other procurement of any other similar vehicle in the past. The Mastiff was brought in to provide mine protection for operations that did not require a small or light vehicle. It had a V-shaped hull, redirecting the blast from explosions away from soldiers inside. This is how the army finally began to get mine protected vehicles, not because of calls from the defence board or chiefs of staff, but from a politician sick of seeing reports of soldiers blown up in the Middle East. It was very unusual for, be, for ministers to be pushing this, you know, uh, which is the way it was. It was the minister saying, look, what is it that you think that you require to solve this problem. Ministers took the decision, whilst the military was still thinking about this, making a decision to say, well, here's another option. And so let's, let's provide you with this other option. And then this, that gives, that gives um, commanders in, in theatre the operation to make the choice. Due to its size, the Mastiff could not replace all vehicles in theatre. So some Land Rovers remained in service until 2010. Eventually, after a lawsuit was brought by the families of soldiers killed in Snatch Land Rovers, it was ordered that they should be replaced as fast as possible with mine-protected vehicles. In Iraq and Afghanistan, more than 120 British personnel were killed in vehicles with no mine protection. Uh, Jack was killed on the 4th of December and Daryl Gardner was killed on the 20th of January with another mine in a minefield. When Jack was blown up, he sent an email, um, or um, an e-bluey, to um, one of Jack's friends at the Honourable Artillery Company to tell him what had happened, and she gave me a copy. I read it. Hi, mate. Well, thought, better write to you following the incident involving Jack. We all took it hard, and obviously they told him that Jack was dead, and uh, found a quiet corner to have a cry for him. Jack was the one I knew best. Apparently Jack's funeral went well, and he had quite a send off. All of us were most gutted that we couldn't get back for his ramp ceremony out of Bastion. Mind you, Zach and Swede were at his funeral. When I get back, I will be visiting his grave because he never got back. He never got back because he was blown up on the 20th of January, killed. In July 2016, a decade after families began lobbying the MOD, a report was published that would give some closure. The inquiry into the Iraq war by Sir John Chilcott found that the MOD had known about the vehicle's vulnerability for years. It said the MOD had been too slow to respond to the threat of improvised explosive devices and in replacing the vehicles. It was not clear which person or department in the Ministry of Defence was responsible for identifying and articulating such capability gaps. Delays in providing adequate medium weight protected patrol vehicles and the failure to meet the needs of UK forces should not have been tolerated. The MOD was slow in responding to the developing threat in Iraq from improvised explosive devices. I found it, I, I swear, I'm an engineer. And I found it really surprising that in a situation where we were losing people 
as a result of not having the right equipment, that the ability to respond to that, to come up with the new equipment, was just not fast enough. It was in 2010 that the MOD announced that the Foxhound would replace the Snatch Land Rover. It was delivered to Afghanistan in 2012, and it's still being used there in Kabul. It offers both blast protection and mobility while maintaining a less aggressive posture. When I was in Kabul last year, British soldiers had a sense of pride knowing that their patrol vehicle is the best one for the job on the narrow, congested streets of Kabul. A massive contrast from when soldiers were being asked to patrol in what was known as a death trap just 10 years before. And there's a story behind that development, a story that starts in Formula One. That industry is set up to be able to adapt, to be agile in terms of responding to, to, to win. You know, lives are not at stake, it's about winning. But they would found a way of being much more responsive quickly and having an engineering flexibility which just seemed to be missing in our defence projects. The Foxhound project learned from both the Mastiff and the motorsports industry, combining lessons from both to quickly produce a vehicle with mine protection, but shrunk down onto a smaller platform. I went to Ricardo UK to find out how they accomplished it. The Land Rover as a platform had its roles, but the threats weren't realised early enough, so we had to get this vehicle out there to protect um, people, you know, and that was the most important thing to us. The emphasis in the design to give us that protection was about um, protecting um, all the automotive components within a V hull, because if we could uh, achieve that, it would mean that we'd be able to disperse the blast better on a light vehicle, a seven and a half, eight and a half tonne vehicle. That was the biggest automotive challenge, where you've got to try and get differentials in there, transfer box, fuel tank, you know, everything's got to be packaged within that V where you would normally see that on a standard truck in a ladder frame chassis. The Foxhound is also designed to be quickly repaired with parts standardised across all four corners of the vehicle. In theory, it's pit stop repairs brought to the battlefield. The entire cabin is also a modular protective pod made of advanced composite materials incorporating Formula One racing technology. And that modular design means that in the future, as the army encounters changing threats, it should be able to adapt quicker than it did 10 years ago. Anyone who understands motorsport from a Formula One to, um, uh, to rally cars, it's about each year you've got a new platform coming out, you need to work on that vehicle quickly because you've got to get it back out on the road or on the track. So we brought in our expertise, which was um, Formula One expertise for the composite body. You know, I can't discuss the materials, but the principles are very similar to what have been used in, in uh, motorsport. Yeah, you, you don't know what the next threat is, so the V-spine, you could do something differently to that if there was a new threat. The pod you could do something to because you know, uh, you know, ballistic is more of an issue than blast, so you could upgrade the pod. Um, so yes, that's all about flexibility. Just like in motorsport, the vehicle was improved on as further test models were being produced. It was a motorsport production line being used for a defence vehicle. Everything was done to speed up the process and what would usually be accomplished in 5 to 15 years of defence procurement was completed in just two. From design to delivery, two years. At the time, people weren't expecting some of the threats that we got in the early days. so we had to turn it around quickly and it shows the British industry uh, can do that. It was down to me and a team but um, we're very proud of that and it's great that you know, what we hear is generally it's the vehicle of choice. I don't think there's another vehicle in the world personally that meets that vehicle because it has got the protection levels similar to the larger vehicles. It meant a lot to us all because a lot of us as a, the military team have been heavily involved in some of the Land Rover programs so we're aware of you know, casualties and it, it it was important to us. The Foxhound is a model of success in engineering and defence procurement. It arrived at the tail end of Britain's Ob Herrick in Afghanistan, just two years before the British Army pulled out of Helmand province. But despite how quickly it was engineered, for many soldiers, it was too late. What should the military have done differently with those lessons learned? So I think it is to have senior people in the military who are deep in understanding of technology. People whose job it is to make sure 
that the generals, you know, the air marshals, the admirals are really clear how their future ability to fight and win is going to depend upon how good they are at technology. War, war is all about innovation and you've got to keep up. Thanks for watching the second episode of Intel. If you have any personal experience with any of the vehicles in this episode, let us know in the comments. And if you want to know more about the engineering of the Foxhound, there's an article on our website and the link is in the description.